warmly welcome to the WoW Epic Mounts versus Sell Your Friends seminar. Uh, in this seminar, I'm going to touch upon subjects that uh, relate to all of us, basically playing. I'm going to look at the game industry and what's happening there, why there are new companies doing games on Facebook, and what does it mean for the rest of us who are making games, say, for consoles. Now, I want to start with the arguing that playing is fundamental to humans. We, we all know that our intelligence separates us from animals, but I would go and argue that playing also in the forms as what we do really separates us from the lower animals. Playing is fundamental to us. It's a way of learning, it's a way of sharing, it's a way of communicating. We've all learned to speak through playing. And we continue to foster relationships through games of tag or, you know, games of inclusion or exclusion, say friendships or, or board games or karaoke or whatever. There are a whole lot of games beyond just computer games that we play in our lives that make us human. I'm going to take quick questions more in after the introduction, and I'll be happy to take them more in the end, but I'll try to go through the introduction and then go into uh, questions. Now, as an example of an of a early game, this is Senate board game from Egypt from around 5,000 years ago. Actually, 5,500 years ago. This is an example of game from now. So if we look at this, well, hmm, the same thing, basically. Why is the same thing is that this chap here, this lady, is actually playing with somebody else. He's not playing a solitaire. He's playing a multiplayer game arguably only with one opponent. These chaps here are playing a multiplayer game with millions of people. Well, actually a couple of thousand per shard, but still. Playing is fundamental. It has changed, the forms have changed, but playing is really part of us as humans. And that's what drives the games business and a whole lot of other businesses also. How many of you have played Wii Fit or heard about Wii Fit? Is this gaming? Who thinks this is a game? I do. It's, but it's interesting when you, how many of you say that it is not a game. The reason why it's just interesting because we have very strict definitions of games. Games are something where we sit down at the front in front of the computer, use a mouse and a keyboard. Games are something where we have a trackpad. Games are something where we have a joypad. Games are something where we have board or something. Games are something where we have rules. No. Games don't need rules. Game don't games do not really need boards. They don't need trackpads. They don't need anything. They need playfulness. Games are a state of mind. They are not rules. They are not peripherals. They are not nothing else but you what happens between these two things. You being a playful state of mind. And then you induct other people in that. So Raf Koster, a very renowned game designer, uh, the lead designer of Ultima Online and Star Wars Galaxy say that single-player games are a historical aberration. And I uh, tend to agree with them. Games really are about playing with somebody. Now, who thinks this is a game? Who knows score me? Or any f who, uh, let's, let's put it the other way. Who have played Facebook games? Some of you. This game actually means that this is like how hot is my friend game. So somebody sen sends you this link and asks you how hot he is. Is it a game? Why damn is it a game? I can give him zero because you're a lousy little fat bastard or you're so hot I want to hug you. So these are games. So these are just for gun, little games, mini games, micro games, not something that we would recognize as games in terms of computer games, but they are games for those people. They are playing these games. The people who are on Facebook, the mainstream users. It's very much a game, especially if, if you get like high scores, like how hot were you rated, are you hotter than my other friends, like how, you can, get, how can you become more hot? So what does this mean? It means that we want to play, and we are prepared to pay for it. Any guesses how much money the game industry brought in software sales or rental or others other ways in last year 2007 any guesses 
how much money ma did the sof uh, game software business make last year? Any guesses? Worldwide. Four billion US. Any better? Anybody raise the figure? You can go much higher. Forty is pretty close. It's it was thirty seven billion US dollars last year. And that's quite a lot if you think about this. The industry didn't exist thirty years ago. Thirty years ago we got Pac Man, we got uh the other classical games like Space Invaders, and that's where this industry was born. This is the g PC console mobile game sales on total uh, worldwide. It doesn't include hardware or peripherals or anything of that sort. Now, before I go to my predictions, I can take, if you had some questions about the introduction, I can take those questions now. Did you have a question about the intro? So we actually have a microphone, so it maybe can't be if you want to run over with the microphone so we can get that on the mic. I'm going to do this a couple of times in the presentation to get the questions there so I can do the flow properly. Well, well drama in games, like in games in role-playing games, especially free from live role-playing games that don't have strict rules, drama is an essential part of that. Uh, but I think it's a separate thing. Games and playing can, uh, can exist without drama. There is no need necessarily to be drama in, in a game. Well, I'm not sure if I understood the question, but I'm yeah. trying to give you a quick I'm gonna give you a quick answer, then we'll move forward. On on drama and game relationship, I think it really it really what what what's important is what you what your mind puts into that. You can introduce normal game moves on board as drama. My unit is moving, it's it's attacking Napoleon, it's gonna win. Maybe that's drama for you. So it's really how we interpret that. But for me, I think that they are different types of art. Drama can ex exist very well without g no games whatsoever. It can be a separate art form, and it is. And games can be completely separate. So I think they are in intertwined, but different. Any other questions on the introduction before I move to predictions? OK, I will move to predictions. So predictions. Now, this is where I give you vague ideas where the industry in go is going. And afterwards, I'll tell you why I believe it's happening. I will not give you any figures because I don't have any figures and I'm not a magician that can pull figures out of a crystal ball. However, here's some uh, uh, examples or sorry, um, not examples, but uh, comparisons between industries. We had the examples of core gaming and I would say World of Warcraft is very much a core gaming product. Some say hardcore, but I would pre prefer to call it core gaming, the traditional gaming segment. Casual games like Bejeweled or Wii Fit they are a growing segment, They're relatively large now if you include the Wii and some DS and some other games on that. And the social games are relatively small, revenue-wise. So these figures, these balls here, represent money. But this represents eyeballs. The eyeballs involved in social games are hugely larger than the eyeballs with, with core. Basically, what this means is that there's a whole lot of people playing the score me games on Facebook, but they're not making any money out of that. However, there is a comparably large segment of people, millions of people worldwide, I'd say tens of millions, playing core games. And they're making a lot of money out of that. Casual games, somewhere in the middle. Basically what this means, it's much harder to monetize currently social games than, it's th than the core games. Now, here comes the predictions part. I would say this is roughly my best understanding of the situation today. Now, what, what would happen in about two years' time, two, three years, is that the core market is continuing to grow. This is the business, so the business revenue is going to grow. It looks small, but abs in absolute terms, it's going to con continue to grow about 10%, 8 to 10% per year. So it's doing very well, actually. Cash oil is exploding, it's going really rapidly. 
what's happening here, we look at, I, w I classify claims like Guitar Hero and Rock Band as casual games because they reach beyond the traditional market. So this market that games that don't need to be hardcore or don't require elaborate rules, easy accessibility is key to those casual games. These games are growing really rapidly. Everybody's investing money into this market currently. All the games publishers are jumping on this bandwagon. The social games market, here we look at the money, and my prediction is the money is coming in now, in about three years' time, two years' time. What's happening here is that we are moving to more elaborate social games with better monetization through things like virtual goods. So currently we have this audience and it's currently completely under monetized, so they are not paying. Eventually, in a couple of years' time, they will be paying. If you look at the eyeballs, the core gaming market is going to continue to grow, not dramatically, but in absolute terms, it's continue to grow. The casual market is growing really rapidly, so but the social market is growing even faster. Once again, it's harder to monetize the social market, but the eyeballs are growing rapidly. And now, if you cannot agree with my slides, here's a tip. Beep, beep, opportunity, make money fast. Where there's growth, there's opportunity. Now, this is what I believe. So this actual final sizes are not really that important. But the point is that the growth is fastest on the social market side, then on the casual market, and even the core market is doing well. So everybody's doing relatively well, but if you're looking to do a new business, like every place is looking to do, you need to focus on the markets that are growing fastest. And now I'm going to dive into all of these segments individually and tell you some of the state of the art in there. So my example of core market is World of Warcraft, and who here doesn't know what World of Warcraft looks like? Okay, you're a, you're a relatively well-versed audience, but let's look at it anyway. So this is from uh, Blizzard's trailer from ways back. This is actually, I think, a uh, gameplay trailer for the original WoW release in 2004. Now, really the promise of the untouched landscapes, be the hero, kill the orcs, or kill the humans if you want. The landscapes, the... the the graphical fidelity, the multiplayer aspects, you know, be in this other world, blah, blah, kill people, get quests, get money, epics, whoa. How many of you are WoW addicts? Nobody admits, at least one, two, okay, a couple of ones. Well, you know the lure, but the lure really eventually beyond all these trappings is are the people. The people make the game alive. You know, if you had this kind of a single player game, it would be looking very dull by 2008. But because there are people in there, it, that makes the game alive. Because people are unpredictable, and playing is all about playing with people. Anyway, enough about, about that gameplay trailer. Let's, look, let's shoot, uh, 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 jump back to the presentation. So this is epic loot. You have your epics, and Blizzard has your money. Your money was 1,100 million US dollars last year, and half of it was profit. Now, I'll let that sunk in a little bit. $517 million profit, which means that every day of the year they made a million and a half dollars profit. Which means that if you take a $1 bills and you put them in a big truck, they could have a money truck come in every day, and the next day another money truck with a million and a half dollars. Pure money to spend some on something else. That's more money than any uh, gaming product is making on profit side as I, uh, I've ever known of. I don't think any, any, the movies have grossed more, but pure profit. This is, this is insane, honestly. These margins are insane, this money is insane, and well, good for them. But is it good for everybody else? And this is really the question. Here we have three traditional segments of the gaming market. We have the PC standalone market, we have the PC MMO market, and we have the console core market. So what's happening here is the PC single player market is dead. I'm sorry guys, if you're playing on PC, you're playing on a dead machine. Honestly. An example. Publishers are seriously thinking about if you do a cross-platform release that has console game and a PC game, the same game, that they will not release the PC game of piracy. 
even if it doesn't cost any more to make the PC game, because it sells nothing. You, we all, we destroyed it by pirating copies. Don't admit, but we have all destroyed it. This market is dead. It's gone. The only solutions to that are digital distribution with strength, stro uh, very strong anti-piracy measures, light MMOs, free-to-play things, things that you where you play with people. But RTS market and all of these, the money isn't going there anyway. It's, come, it's become very niche. And unfortunately, Finland is actually it's a very strong PC market. So we, continue, we still continue to play PC games. But if you go to the United States, it's, it's really, honestly, dead and dying and gone. PC MMOs doing very well. Good growth. The question is, how long will WoW rule? Is there going to be anybody else? Is there a good market for anybody else? Because it costs about 50 million US dollars to make a MMO. And to compete with WoW, it probably costs you 10 times more. So can anybody else succeed in this market? Is it just Blizzard and nobody else? And the question is, what happens with free-to-play market? Because WoW is very core gaming market, so there's opportunities for other players to make smaller games. This business is relatively healthy, m making games for consoles, because there there's very limited piracy. It's currently the PS3s and Xbox 360s are reaching mainstream market, and eventually they are starting to become more actually casual focused. New games, if they are very well made, they have to sell about a million units, which is twice the units you had to sell in the previous generation to make any money. So this is becoming expe very expensive. Now, I'm going to show you an example of casual games. Who knows what the bejeweled is? A few. So. Here's an example of uh, the traditional casual game. This is a bit jubile. This is the Match 3 game. This was released in 2001. This is the iconic casual game. This defined the casual gaming industry. This is what your moms play, at least in the United States. Everybody who's like over 55, they play these kind of games. They go to pojo.com, they go to uh, shockwave.com, and they play these games. Uh, this and a couple others. This is typically uh, really a soccer mom segment. I, I would say about 60-70% of the paying customers are females over 45 or 50 years old. Now, this, this is how the casual industry defines itself. However, I would, con I would argue that casual actually means approachability. Short session gameplay, short games. You don't need to play uh, 10 hours. You can play 15 or 30 minutes. So games like uh, Guitar Hero, because they're very accessible, very mainstream, and very short session, actually, for the most of the players, are part of the casual movement. And Wii, of course, is Nintendo Wii is, of course, the casual games leader in console space. These charts here, the three graphs you see here, are lifetime sales of consoles. The green graph is lifetime sales of Xbox 360. From start, it's, it's basically they are all moved to the start. That they start on the same day, sort of, if they were to be sold on the same day, and then how well they've been selling since. The blue, uh, red line is PS3, PlayStation 3, and the blue line is the Nintendo Wii. So the Nintendo Wii is, is globally pretty much now the top selling console, and, it's, and when you look at the curve, it's going faster upwards. Now the question, of course, is there a good market on the Nintendo Wii for anybody else than Nintendo? Because typically on Nintendo platforms, Nintendo games sell, and the other games don't sell that well. But seriously, Nintendo is, is just rolling in cash, like a Blizzard. Now, here's our console casual games. Guitar Hero, you know, Mario even, to some extent. Wii Play, Wii Sports, and also the uh, um, other sort of uh, like a downloadable games that are really focused on the accessibility. These are doing exceedingly well. However, as these are mainstream games, you need a lot of marketing power to be really successful. So it's becoming more polarized. It's not a market that you can easily ad address. But there are ways of uh, reaching new audiences there. It's a hard market, but if, you can, if you're successful there, you'll do really, really well. Now, the trends here are really strong. It expands the market, it, it creates new genres, and there are really games for everyone. 
This is, this is to steal the domain of the traditional games publishers and traditional game developers. So if you're making games for an internet Wii, you probably have an opportunity to create new, new types of gaming experiences. Now, this is a very exciting segment. This is the PC casual game segment. How many of you have heard of a game called um, Diner Dash? Some of you, good. Diner Dash is a game, it's a basically a, I would say it's a real-time strategy game almost, or a click management game. Basically what you do, you have this waiter, and there's a kitchen, and there, uh, there are some uh, customers. And you need to uh, click to move, uh, you know, pancakes or pizza, whatever, from, from the kitchen to the people who ordered that, and decorate your house and whatever, on doing so. Very popular with the girls. I don't know why. I cook out. I, I make the food at our house, so I should probably play, be playing that game. Uh, this is the Bejeweled segment, the PC downloadable games. There are interesting developments here. It this all started so that you download a game, you get a free trial, you can play five times of uh, one hour, and then you have to buy the game. And 1% of the people who download actually buy, or 2%. So very low conversion ratios. What's happening is that this business is moving towards the Flash business, the Flash games, because Flash is becoming much more expressive language it's much more uh, uh, better suited for this game because you can play in your browser. Everybody has the Flash script in uh, or Flash player installed, so it's very easy to actually get to these games. So the down, I see the download segment eventually dying off and being completely replaced by the Flash games. Also, because the Flash games are already online, typically these casual games they don't have any multiplayer whatsoever, almost nothing. So now it's becoming more and more online and multiplayer focused through the Flash games also. They are also adding virtual goods into these games. Diner Dash, for example, uh, made an online version where you can buy virtual goods and decorate your uh, uh, diner and buy new diners and headsets and whatever. And that's been really popular in the US. Here's my uh, favorite segment, the casual MMO. How many, how many of you have played Habbo? A couple of old guys are ashamed to say I played Habbo. I played Habbo. Uh, this and whole lot of other uh, segments like Club Penguin, uh, Gaia, Nicol Nicolopolis, there are like tens and tens of casual MMOs aimed at teens and tweens. Tweens are basically 8 to 12 years and teens are 13 and up in the US. So these are very popular. Uh, Hubble has what, 8 million monthly average users. Think about it, 8 million monthly average users. And and WoW has 10 million paying customers. Of course, about 5 million of them are in China and not, don't pay that much. But still, it's a Finnish game. It's almost as big as WoW. Not money-wise, but person-wise. Think about it. We typically uh, dismiss it as a kids, kids game. Like, uh, have off, uh, bah, kids play, stupid. It's actually very important. It's, it's really, it's the leader in this segment. There's, there are more and more games coming here to this, this market. Even if they're not really games as we see them, they are more worlds, virtual worlds. They're becoming more free to play, that basically you don't pay anything, you just pay for the items. That's basically the model behind Habbo. And web integration is becoming more and more important, so you can watch YouTube on your Habbo site or, or say Gaia online. The real the challenges on this market is can this market reach other age groups? Do people that are over 20 play these games? Typically not, as today. There's so many of these games that it's becoming a very crowded market, and it's getting expensive to launch these games. All right, so social games. Uh, here's a video of Friends for Sale. Friends for Sale is a Facebook game. The idea on Friends for Sale is that you can sell your friends and buy your friends. It's sort of a stock market thing. How much is Tatu worth? Tatu is the head of Assembly TV. He's worth uh, 248,000 US dollars. Very expensive. So I, can, I couldn't buy Tatu, but I could buy uh, Marco. Marco is the Infodesk guy. Marco is much cheaper because Assembly TV rules over Infodesk. Ma Marco only costs, uh, I think, was. 605, so he's like 
a hundred times less expensive than Tatu. So I'm buying Tatu, uh, sorry, Marco. Now I own him. This is how I play the game. So we, we trade back and forth these people, and we sort of, uh, it's a stock market that we are trying to play, and then we can call, he become my pet now. So I can make things to him because he's pet, so I have him in a leash and I can move him around and call him names and stuff. So this is a, the, the sort of the, the definite uh, social game because it couldn't exist without the social network where my friends are, we're doing this is fun. You know, if I were, were to buy you, I don't know you, what do I care? But I know Tatu, I care, you know, if I own Tatu, I'm gonna make him my bitch. So, actually, that's, that's why I would like to own Tatu. Or he like, he, if he buys me, what does that mean? So these, these are social games that play on the relationships of people. They leverage those. So this is a graph of daily average users for friends for sale. It's been actually going down. So it's an interesting question of what happens. It used to average about 700,000 daily users. So if you think about 700,000 people every day, now it's going down to about 600,000 daily average. That's a quite a lot of people selling people, selling their friends. Like, uh, Yeah, it's a game, definitely. If you think about it, it's a different kind of thing, but where's the money? They are not really making a whole lot of money on this. Actually, I think they're probably losing money because they have to pay for the servers, and all they get are lousy banner ads on Facebook. So my prediction for the social network games is that they're growing very rapidly as they are now. There's huge amounts of uh, venture capital money going into this. Zynga, one of these companies, just raised uh, 30 million this year. Social Games Network raised about 16 million US. So there's a whole lot of money being thrown at this because of the number of eyeballs. It's like almost web 1.0 web industry again. Eyeballs means money, not. So there's a whole lot of venture money com coming in. Uh, the monetization sucks greatly, but this is starting. The, uh, the monetization I see here is really people buying stuff. For example, if I were to own Tatu, I might actually pay 20 cents to slap him and will make him a dog size. So he would look like a dog, had Tatu's face and go bark, bark. Yeah, I could probably pay 20 cents for that. Yeah, probably. Another 50 cents for get somebody who would like chang, chang, he would go ah! Yeah, so this kind of stuff, this kind of a habit like, you know, buy, buy stuff, you know, apply to your friends. Yeah, I can see that happening. So that's uh, the money will be coming from you, not not really from the advertisers. So you will be paying for things like this. It, it sounds a bit far fetched, but yeah, I think that's where the money is. This is very f there's a whole lot of fads, basically things that come and go. Something becomes huge and then dies. It's they they call it the shark fin because it looks like a shark fin the user user base. The whole of the competition. It's a fast moving business. It's still unproven in many ways. I think eventually w what we will see the casual market and the social network games market merging. For example, trivia games are becoming increasingly popular on social network sites. And trivia is to the, the archetype of uh, casual games. You all play Trivial Pursuit. That would be a casual game for me. Now, here's a very interesting segment that's completely undefined. It's called funware. Funware is using games in applications that are not games. You know, eBay is a game. Ranking books on Amazon is a game. We are, they are using game mechanics to make your buying experience on eBay much better. Actually, eBay has hired a game designer. I'm not making this up. They have a game designer, very senior on their staff, to make the eBay game better. So we are seeing more and more games taken outside of the context of games and being moved into your banking applications, your Ferraris, your Subarus. I'll take an example. You go and jog. Uh, or actually, I'll take an example of Subaru. Subaru has on their uh, cars a G-force indicator that has high, high scores. So the more you go on the slide, the bigger high scores. The next thing they need is an uplink to compare those uh, globally. It's a game. 
we are getting the, the, the point here really is that all of, all of the products and services we already buy as consumers are relatively good value, relatively cheap, typically good design, and good utility. They do what they're supposed to do typically. And they are cheap. They come from China. So where do we compete with? The next frontier of competition is making them more entertaining. And games can make any service, any product more entertaining. And this is what, what some people call, call food force. Actually, Wikipedia is an MMO, like it or not. Uh, here's one of my key theses is that the games are the ultimate happiness engine. Games can make your life happy. Uh, well, I would say if you guys are probably scared of shitless about this because it's going to be the government force-feeding us games, making us happy. Happiness is mandatory. Gaming is Playing is mandatory. Actually, I like that. Uh, honestly, games can really... A whole lot of us suck at life. You know, suck at relationship, suck at doing whatever. You know, life is complicated. Games are, uh, games make things simple. They have rules. I can succeed. I can be happy about being the WoW guild leader. Games can make people very, very happy. Okay, so let's see how much time do I have left. I have uh, a whopping. Hey, Tiatoya. I have. Oh. 20 minutes almost. Good. Trends. So what's happening? Uh, what's happening is self-expression is coming more and more important for all types of games. So this picture is from Habo, but it doesn't matter what the game is. I want to customize my avatar. I want to customize my gaming experience. I want to in my my I want my views, my beliefs to change the game that I'm playing. It's no longer enough for the game to be a static package experience that I cannot tinker with. I have the right to hack as a consumer. I want to change it. I want to make it look like me. It's not just avatars. It's, sh it's more about what do I do with this and sharing this with other people. So if you're making a box product where you don't have any customization options, you're missing this boat. User-generated content. This is another part of that. Not always when you customize something, you have to share it. But sharing this, this is uh, LOL, ki uh, LOL uh, cats. Who know LOL cats? Yeah, we all know LOL cats. Uh, you know, this is user generated content at, at its best. You know, burrito killer. Yeah, well, we are laughing. You know, not the maze game. I'm laughing. Yeah. Now, this is user generated content. How much do you allow your, your users? to screw up your game and make it funnier. And you think, oh my god, don't ruin my game. But they're making it funnier for it themselves. So it goes with the right, uh, right to hack. Your users will change your game whether you like it or not if you let them. If you don't let them, they won't come eventually. So might just open up and let them do it. Collaboration. Just being one user and creating stuff isn't enough anymore. There has to be multiple people doing it, or, or people want to do it together. We want to create together. We want to play in the creation of things. We want to collaborate. We want to create stuff together. So let us be together. Let us form groups. Let us share. Let us create, and then show the world how great game developers we are, because we took your lousy little game, and we make it a lot of funnier by putting in Turkish songs and lol cats. And it came much funnier. So your RTS become, becomes about moving Turkish kebabs to lol cats. Maybe. Who knows? Uh, this is about breaking up down the walled garden. So when you look at online games, they typically are a protected, safe environment. Like Habo, or, or uh, let's say, what would be a good example? Mm. Habo is actually a pretty good example. Here's a box, and within this box is Habo. Here's the world. It's all around it. It, it isn't in the Habo game. And what's happening is more and more, this box, this wall around the game is, is going to go away. It's, we already think it's stupid if, if we have a, say, a web calendar uh, service where we couldn't link to our blog or have feed from our blog to go into a, a calendar system. Or, say, your Flickr images wouldn't be available on your blog. That would be completely stupid. Like, what's the point? You know, the stuff's there. Let me, let me integrate those. That's going to happen more and more to games that are on, are on the net. 
So what this means to games, it's going to be very interesting because that will enable games to become part of the web, not just a, you know, isolated segment within the web. They will be part of the web. I believe sincerely that everything can be turned into a game. These are lovely ladies going on for a jog in the New York Central Park. They are playing a game because they have their Nikes and their uh, iPods, which track where they run, how long did it take them to run this uh, loop, and they can upload their scores to Nike's social network and compare their runs to other people. So suddenly we have augmented reality gaming here. People who are completely mainstream, people who don't think they're actually playing games, but they are. So gaming is becoming more and more part of our lifestyle, more a part of all the services. So this is the fun of our aspect. Think about where you can apply games. I, I challenge you, you can apply them in a lot of circumstances. This whole lesson actually, or lecture should be a, should be a game, but I know Finnish, Finnish audiences were not very good at playing games in, in lectures, so I would get blank stares, so I'm doing a lecture. Free to play will rule, this is the king. Hail to the king, baby. If you are creating a new game today, you should do it with free to play. Let everybody play, and then you monetize by asking them to buy stuff on top of their experience. The ways of selling a product on the box, on the shelf, are starting to slowly but surely go away. The ways of selling a product as one box are slowly but surely going away. Remember, what is the most profitable game in the universe. It's a World of Warcraft. Where does it make money from? By selling you time to play the game. It is not selling you a box, it's selling you time. It already, the model of the box product is no longer the most profitable mo model. The model currently for the most profitable mo uh, business in I on game industry is service sales. You buy a month, you buy another month. So the times of you going to eBay eventually will be uh, out. Oh, sorry, going to Electronics Boutique or uh, or um, Tilt or any other shop. Free hugs for everybody. Games will be become eventually accepted by all. Now, let me tell you a story uh, from the 19th century in, in uh, London. They had this, uh, the Times in London had a big article about the new scourge coming to London, a new bad thing that comes, and fathers and mothers beware, there's this awful thing coming, it's going to turn your, uh, your uh, kids into prostitutes and, you know, bad people. And you know what that was? That was waltz, falsy. That was a bad thing. Then it was, then it was uh, movies. Then it was rock and roll, then it was VHS tapes, uh, uh, then it was uh, role-playing games, then it was, uh, was comic books, and now it is computer games. They are evil. They make your kids into murderers. Well, eventually it's going to be accepted. I like how, how this lady actually has a uh, assembly bracelets. I, I really like that. Anyway, so games will evolve, more people will play, Games will become, be, become of the society, like films have. And it will take some time, but eventually we will all be playing, uh, even though we don't think we are playing. All types of, games are, uh, types of gaming are growing. So if you are in the gaming business, you are in a great business because it's growing, which means opportunities. Opportunities for you to make whatever you dream of. If you want to really shake things up, you should be in the segments that are growing fastest which are the casual or the social gaming market, which are pretty much more the same, just different slants on things. But if you want to do big budget things, if you want to do the movies of game industry, then you go to the core gaming segment because they have loads of money. But if you want to do your thing, you should be in the casual or the social market because that are, that's where the opportunity is. Now, I want to close by asking you to play with me, play with her, play with anybody. Because games enhance interaction. It makes our life more meaningful be if I can play with you. I believe that games can enhance services. They can make, make your banking experience more fun. 
They can make your buying from buying used goods on eBay. They can make it that more fun. They can make products more fun. I'm still looking for the coffee maker that plays with me. Maybe tells me that you see you've been having five cups of uh, tea this week. You're not up to your standard. G drink more. And really rethink what games are. Games are not what you see on your PC screen, not just that. Games are much more. You can apply games to so many more things. So rethink how you consider games and think of the opportunities that are arising. And with that, I, I thank you and open the floor for questions. Any questions there, please? Uh, just let, let's get the microphone to you. It is, but it's on low. Well, it's a, it's an API, like Facebook API. In terms of an API, it's really important for making it easier for developers to create social networking games on other platforms. Uh, I think it's an important platform. If you're making social network games, you should do open social, you should do Facebook, you should basically do every single API you can think of. So in that terms, I think it's important for that market as an enable, enabler of social networking games. Other questions? Here's one. Yeah. All right, shoot. Oh, oh, true. Oh, on that one particle. Well, yeah, I should have probably taken the curve from uh, the beginning of 2000. And no, actually, Facebook actually uh, Facebook platform opened in almost a year ago. There were zero users, and then they went. To if you cr if you look at all the applications, the the category of applications is uh, they're like serious applications for work or whatever in Facebook, and the curve from serious to fun goes like. This. Here's poke, here are games, and the rest, nob nobody uses uh, Facebook for, any for anything else than fun applications. So if I would take the average of all Facebook games and how much they are played, that would look very different. So this was for this particular game. The actual the Facebook games on, over on overall are huge, hugely popular, but games come and go. Th this game is going down currently, but uh, it might c go back up. This is really a market where you don't know. So one, I said about fads. Games are very much faddish on, uh, on social networks. They go up and then go out. And the next one comes up. And then the next one. Yeah, uh, I think that what I'm seeing uh, seeing really is the money, the venture capital thinking is that if there are... Yeah, it, it in many ways it looks pretty similar because there isn't that much money. There's a huge amount of eyeballs, but they're not that much money. So that looks the same. Web 1.0 was uh, somewhat different, but quite similar. But I will address the concern of whether it's going to be a new Facebook. Yeah, probably. MySpace was really popular. There was no Facebook three years ago. Now there's MySpace and Facebook. Who knows what happens in two years' time? Now the concept of games in terms of social networks, I think that's going to remain regardless of if it's on Facebook or Facebook 2 or Facebook 3. That doesn't really matter. The platform doesn't really matter. The what matters is it that we use the web to connect with our friends. We, we want to share information. We want to connect with people. Web is a communication media. So social gaming in terms of playing with people and playing in terms of social interaction is going to grow rapidly 
whether it's on Facebook or MySpace 6 or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Currently, those are the platforms. But in, the, in two years' time, I don't know what the platform is, but the concept of social gaming is, is on the rise. Did I add a... Add No. True. True. Yes. Well, well, if if I would look back, twenty or thirty years, and and think think about the society in the old old crisis days, pretty much nobody of us was almost born there, and somebody would tell us someday there will be thousands of people whose title is to design games, dream of rules for people just to play. No, no, it's never going to happen. It's it's like the whole class of people, game designers, it doesn't really exist 20 years ago, really, on a, on a large I scale. Well, well, we. True. Well, yeah, there they it has more spe it has become more specialized. We have recognized that, and in in I would say I uh, I agree with you. I would sort of take it a bit further the comment you made, but I do agree with the comment. That was the good que uh, questions. Any other questions? I'm sure there's at least one here. Yes. Uh, we have altogether two minutes for any question there might may be. Last question, if there's any. If not, I really urge you to go out and rethink what you're doing in terms of the trends I highlighted. Self-expression, user-generated content, collaboration, breaking down the walls, and all together just rethinking what a game can be. And can your, if you're doing a serious application, can your serious application have a fun side to it? Because it, it can will become more sticky, people will like it more, and they will buy it. And you'll be, you will be more successful. Thank you and rethink.